there will be another outstanding program. We welcome you all, especially the first time attendees. A very warm welcome to Sarah Brown, who is Temple Micah's new communications and administrative associate. I'd like to ask all of you now to keep yourselves muted and to switch to the speaker view if you have not done so already. To get us started today, it is my pleasure now to call Francie Schwartz, who will present a reading she has selected in keeping with today's topic. Thank you so much, Harriet. And um, thank you to uh, the Burstons for uh, joining us. Um, I chose a, a reading by Pastor Martin uh, Niemuller entitled Stuttgart Confession of Guilt. And let me tell you a little bit about uh, something about Pastor uh, uh, Neymuller. Uh, he was the most prominent leader of the anti-Nazi confessing church in Germany. In uh, 1934, he formed the pastor's emergency league and from uh, July 1937 until the end of the war, he was held in prison and concentration camps. And he, um, he wrote this confession of guilt in October 1945. So he obviously did survive everything that the Nazis could throw at him. Uh, and he did, uh, he wrote this um, uh, to the leaders of the German church as they confessed their failure as Christians adequately to fight against Nazism. First they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I didn't speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. So this just sends me a message of whenever we see injustice, it, we are incumbent to speak out. Thank you. Thank you, Francie, as always, for your spiritual guidance. You're a wonderful teacher and you always set the right tone. Let me explain the format of the rest of today's program. I'll shortly be introducing our speakers, Helen Burston and Mark Blumenthal, who will be giving their presentation, which will be followed by the question and answer period moderated by Sid Booth. At around 1 p.m., my wonderful co-chair, Karen, will introduce the second half of our program. David Diskin, our very able Zoom host, will then split the group into breakout rooms to enable us to socialize and discuss today's topic. We want to thank our speakers for providing a question to start your discussions off. This will be posted in the chat function and read aloud before we go into our groups. At about 1.25 p.m., we will gather some concluding remarks. Just a few housekeeping reminders. It is important you keep yourself muted until we get to the breakout rooms later. This will prevent any noise interfering with our speaker's presentation. With regard to your video screen, it is up to you whether you wanna be seen or not, but our speakers have indicated they'd be very happy to see your faces. Lastly, in order to avoid sound interference in the Zoom format, please do not use more than one device signed into the Lunch and Learn program in the same room. Our speakers today are Helen Burston and Mark Blumenthal. The title of today's presentation is Frank Burston's Stories, Story, Who Knows What Tomorrow Will Be. This is a multimedia presentation about the life of Helen's father, Frank Burston, 
and his experiences during and after the Holocaust. Helen and Mark and Mark will tell Frank's story through excerpts of his video testimony, his autobiography, poems, and family photos. I will now introduce Helen and Mark. Helen Burston, MD, MPH, MACP, is the Chief Executive Officer of the Council of Medical Specialty Societies, a coalition of 45 specialty societies representing more than 800,000 physicians. Dr. Burston formerly served as Chief Scientific Officer of the National Quality Forum. She has also served as Director of the Center for Primary Care, Prevention and Clinical Partnerships at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Prior to this, Dr. Burston was the Director of Quality Measurement at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Assistant Professor at Harvard Medical School. Mark Blumenthal is a survey research consultant who currently writes poll analysis for the online research company, YouGov. Previously, he was head of election polling at SurveyMonkey, senior polling editor for the Huffington Post, co-founder of pollster.com, creator of the mystery pollster blog, and a longtime pollster and campaign consultant. Helen and Mark have been members of Temple Micah since 2008. With a last reminder to keep muted and to post your questions to everyone in the Zoom chat, I am pleased to turn the floor over to our distinguished speakers, Helen Burston and Mark Blumenthal. Thank you so much for that lovely intro. Uh, I definitely need a, a shorter bio. <laughs> um, so what Mark and I would like to do today is uh, do a bit of a reprise if you saw something we did a couple of years ago um, uh, to honor my father during, uh, uh, during Yam HaShoah. Uh, Mark did all the technology piece of pulling together just this remarkable, really a treasure trove that my father left for us, his legacy of um, both writing two books that I helped him with um, that are available at the Holocaust Museum uh, uh, in their library and happy to share PDFs with anybody who'd like to see them, um, but also uh, his uh, our trip back to Poland when he was ready uh, and really he wrote, used his writing to treat his PTSD after the camps. Um, and then uh, remarkably became a poet in his 70s and spent probably the last decade of his life primarily writing poems about the Holocaust. I've got about 150 of them. We'll share about 10 of them with you today. Um, and uh, really just it's remarkable uh, what he was able to leave us, although he's been gone for almost a decade at this point. Um, we are uh, incredibly thrilled to be able to share with you some of what he's what he's been able to um, record, uh, write about, and share. I'm going to let Mark give a quick intro into what you're going to see on the video itself. We'll then show the video, and we'll have lots of time for questions. So Mark, to you. Thank you, Helen. Um, I just have uh, a quick uh, sort of note and then two credits. So the note is, as Helen explained, because we really wanted to share all of this material, videos, poems, uh, family photos, we created this highly multimedia presentation. It's really, it, it, it has about a, several hundred times where we have to advance the slides. And I was worried that Zoom and the way things sometimes don't work with Zoom, it would be better if we just used a recorded version. So what you're gonna see is a version that we recorded. So it should go flawlessly once it starts. If we were on a physical BEMA, there are times when the slides just fade to black. And if we were speaking to you, that would feel like nothing. You'd just see us talking and everything would be great. Um, there are times when you're gonna see a dark screen. To try to make that a little less jarring, there are gonna be little postage stamp size photos of me or Helen to signify that we're talking, but don't worry, it, everything is working great. Um, the two credits are uh, the readings of the poems that Helen's father wrote are voiced by a local actor and musician named Michael Albin, who's also our son's guitar teacher, who does a fabulous job at that. And during the poems, mostly, you will see a series of landscape photos by a Polish photographer named, I'm mispronouncing his name, I'm sure, Arkadis Bezier, who I found uh, through the Flickr service. Uh, the very first image is, a, is actually an image of uh, Frank Burston's town. And the other images are all from some nearby areas in Poland. So just know that that connection is there. And with that, I will turn it over to our host to start playing the video. 
Okay, let's give this a shot. The first thing most people noticed about my father was his smile. He spoke softly, had a gentle, down-to-earth manner, and could strike up a friendly conversation with just about anyone. It was not until he rolled up his sleeves and you saw the numbers tattooed on his arm, 124053, that you got a glimpse of Whoops. in Poland. Okay, 50 sorry Poland. about that. He did a happy life. He lived a living within. The numbers from Auschwitz were the most prominent mark of six years of persecution and nearly four years of slave labor, of his strength and resilience, of his limitless endurance, and miraculous survival at the hands of the Nazi death machine. Though the numbers were a discordant reminder during an otherwise happy life, he learned to wear them as a badge of honor. They symbolized all that he had endured and the duty he felt to tell his story in all its horrific detail so that none of us would ever forget. We can share his story with you because of the work he did toward the end of his life to record it in a two-part self-published memoir and hours of oral testimony and over 150 poems. He desperately wanted to share his legacy with his children, grandchildren, and generations to come so they would know his story, cherish their heritage, and never let the suffering happen again. The man we knew as Pop was born Efraim Bushtanovich in 1925 in a town called Ludomayersk near Ludge, Poland. His mother, Hanna, descended from Sephardim from Spain. His father, Shraga, loved Caruso's opera and cantoral music and was a scholar who believed that knowledge came from reading and studying Torah. There were other influences, particularly his two older sisters, Chaya, the independent-minded, dark-haired beauty, Faiga, the tall brunette and passionate Zionist who dreamed of going to Israel, and a younger sister, Bronya, sweet and just blonde and blue-eyed enough to pass for German. Pop was an avid reader who always scored at the top of his public school classes. He was set to begin study at an academically competitive modern Jewish high school in Ludge, where the family lived during the school year, when on September 1st, 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. Joy. They were happy people, enjoying life and joy. They had dreams and hopes. Then came the wind and carried them off like leaves in autumn. The next morning, he watched the Nazis march into Ludge. In Ludomayersk, they confiscated the family's hotel, executed 12 prominent Jews, and burned the synagogue. Later that winter, with the Nazis poised to move the Jews of Ludge into a ghetto, the family moved back to Ludomayersk, only to be forced into a half-mile open ghetto that was subsequently closed off. They were confined there for the next two years. Then, in October 1941, Pop's name appeared on a list of able-bodied men between the ages of 14 and 45, ordered to report for deportation to work camps in Germany. After several painful days, he packed a small valise, kissed and hugged them all, and said farewell. He was 16 years old. He would never see his parents or his sisters again. They were killed nine months later at the Chelmno death camp. Memories. Even though my life was short with you all, I'm forced to leave you now. Sad and broken hearted, my eyes full of tears. To an unknown fate and a road with no signs. Where are you taking me? What will be my destiny? The gates close behind me, and silence and sorrow take over. All my dreams of the future and plans never came through. But my memory of you all will live on forever. Pop left with his brother-in-law, Yosek, Chaya's husband, and they spent two days in closed cattle cars. The next day, the Germans selected Pop for one camp and Yosek for another. Yosek took off his woolen scarf and wrapped it around Pop's neck. He would never see Yosek again. 
A few months later, Yosek was found dead in his bunk, simply worked and starved to death. For the nearly four years that followed, Pop was a slave laborer at a succession of Nazi concentration camps. He spent those years building roads, including the Reich Autobahn, constructing a munitions factory and working in several others. He owed his survival to a combination of sheer luck and determination mixed with healthy doses of smarts and chutzpah. At one of the early camps, for example, he likely would have perished working with highly toxic phosphorus gas, but instead bluffed and claimed he had experience working with a crane shovel. As a result, he was chosen to help operate a 12-story crane on a construction site, the first time a Jew had been picked for such duty. In fact, he had never before even seen such a crane, much less operate one. But he had a knack for making friends and figuring out machinery, and within a few weeks, he had both learned to operate the crane and charmed his German overseer. They started to chat, and the scraps of food the German gave him prolonged Pop's life. But even at the early camps, conditions were inhumane. Jews were beaten with whips to work faster. The winter was cold. His clothes were usually in rags, and frostbite was common in winter. Death became a daily occurrence. Rain. Rain is falling on my face and running down like salty tears. My shoes are full of holes and the road is full of mud and soon the winter will be here and my soul is in fear. I'm standing like a candle, weak and dripping in silence awaiting my destiny. One cold night, he was summoned to unload a train shipment of phosphorus. After hours of pushing handcarts of the toxic chemical into the factory, his shoe got stuck in the snow. Somehow, I lost the shoe. I want to go back for it. And this is German. It's not the shovel. Another side of that. I feel that I'm bleeding from the mouth and from the head. I couldn't stop. I walked through the whole night. That's what it. Pop recovered, but a traumatic cataract formed that left him blind in his left eye for the rest of the war. In June 1943, two years after his initial deportation, Pop arrived at the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. He was one of just 238 of a trainload of 1,300 selected to live and continue in captivity as a slave. The rest had either perished during five days of transport in closed cattle cars or were immediately marched to the gas chambers and killed. The SS registered Pop, shaved his head, and tattooed the number 124053 on his left arm. At Birkenau, Pop and his fellow inmates were eyewitnesses to mass genocide. 24 hours a day, he later wrote, you could smell human flesh from the crematorium. All day long, they watched the march of new arrivals and its aftermath. Zyklon B. I have seen young girls going naked with sad faces, covering their hands, their private places. I watched them go from a distance, and they were gone. I have seen young boys surging by. They were all naked, too weak to cover their private places. I watched them disappear from a distance and they were gone. After two weeks at Birkenau, he was transferred to the main Auschwitz work camp and assigned to the same bunk as a good friend from the previous camp named Tulek. They were put to work building nearby roads. One night, an SS doctor entered their barracks and started randomly selecting Jews for removal. Tulek was chosen. Popt assumed his friend was headed to the gas chambers, but the next day, Tulek returned. He had spent the night at Auschwitz's infamous block number 10. 
he could hardly walk. Tulik's legs were black and blue from electrical shock, and he had been castrated without benefit of anesthesia. So, I could only give him the evening correction, whatever I had, but they had no food, so they, whatever I had, we ate together. The copper from our block. What did you? And the other one was, was, was a Czech. And I had a quarter like private. And I went in there and I begged them, don't send them out to work. Whatever you want, I'll do, I'll work twice, whatever. Keep them here in the barrack for a day. And I guess that my crying after play. While Tulik eventually recovered from his physical wounds, Pop later wrote, his mental state would never be the same. A few months later, while working on a new stretch of road, Pop found some sugar beets. For several nights, he snuck handfuls back to camp. One night, an SS guard discovered two beets in his pants. And they were lined up. I guess he spotted something on me. He pulled me on the side, took out what I had, got on my mouth. So I don't finish. And I was put into the trap just like the head. Uh, put your head in, uh, tie your hands up, and that's when you have like. Uh, not only the last year, you have to count. Uh, the skin was all cut up, and I came back for this sort of flying in order to me. Eighteen months after his arrival at Auschwitz, the Germans moved to shut down both the main camp and its satellites. In January of 1945, during one of the coldest winters on record, Pop and the other inmates were forced on a week-long march to the Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria. They were given little food or water, and the SS guards were ordered to kill prisoners who could no longer walk or keep up. The hunger was unbearable, Pop later wrote. It creates a pain in your stomach. It never stops. It is all our brain can think about. The Fifth Day Dark clouds are hanging low in this January late afternoon. We stop on this frozen field covered with snow to spend the night. This is the fifth day of the death march. There are thousands of us here, and many never made it to here. Each morning we wake up for another day of marching and leave the frozen bodies behind. How much longer can we endure? But this march continues. To where? By the seventh or eighth day, his shoes were gone, his feet were frozen like wooden planks, and he thought his end was near. The march reached the Enns River, which they knew meant they were just a few miles from Mauthausen. So there used to be a bridge over there to cross, or trucks and carts and so on. The bridge was one book, was uh, knocked out a couple weeks before. And they built like a complaint on the bridge, just to maybe three, four feet wide, just to run through wood, wooden bridge across the end of the river. And the river, they were elevated, so the river looked like maybe 20 feet below Talos Coast. That was late in the afternoon, and as we were running through the bridge, Every couple of feet in the test, when you to try to kick you, you should fall down. I was kicked. I survived. I ran across. Next morning, we find out in, in camp, there was a couple of hundred bodies frozen on the internet. Of 1,300 who started the march with Pop, 
only 968 made it to Mauthausen on January 30th, 1945. Although the Germans were now in full retreat on all fronts, they would not reach Austria until spring. He was transferred yet again to an underground munitions factory near Vienna. In late April, with Allied troops rapidly advancing, the Nazis marched Pop and the others over 100 miles back to Mauthausen and, ultimately, to a large sub-camp named Gusen. By now, Pop weighed just 56 pounds and could barely stand. By his own account, he was holding on with his last breath of life. Then on May 5, 1945, Gusen was discovered by a reconnaissance squadron of the 11th Armored Division of the 3rd Army of the United States. A tank broke through the front gate and brought down the Arbeit macht frei sign. After six years of inhumanity and nearly four years of concentration camp slave labor, Pop was free. There was no celebration or any kind of fanfare. I was free. I was disappointed that nobody came to welcome me back from hell. Yes, I have waited a long time for this day and paid for it dearly. And now the day came. It seemed like a dream. I wrote this story not to scare you or weaken you but to keep up this dream of freedom. Now, it is up to you to keep it up. This ends the saddest part of my life. 50 years later, Pop used those words to begin the chapter titled Freedom in his self-published memoir. But with liberation came hard questions. How can you have hope, he asked, when nobody cares about you? To die for an idea is worthwhile, he wrote, but to die for just being a Jew, how can you accept it or talk about it? He offered no answers in his memoir except for the way he lived the rest of his life and the philosophy behind it is reflected in the poem he wrote and chose for the book's dedication page. Why should I think about yesterday and lose this beautiful today? Why should I worry about a tomorrow that may never be? So live for today, because yesterday will never return, and who knows what tomorrow will be. After liberation, he moved forward. Wandering Eastern Europe with Tulik and several other survivor friends, he joined the Irgun and ultimately landed at a displaced persons camp in Torino, Italy, which they saw as a path to Palestine. In Italy, he taught orc classes in sewing, enjoyed the sun, and joined a soccer team. One night at a movie, he met a very pretty, poised young woman named Ruzsa Dziwacz, a Jewish refugee from eastern Poland who had escaped the Germans only to be forcibly evacuated by the Soviets to Siberia for the rest of the war. They soon started seeing each other and were inseparable for the next 60 years. Together, they were more than just a couple. They were partners in survival. Mom and Pop were married at the DP camp in Italy on September 18, 1948. She wore a dress rented from the photographer, and he wore a suit he had sewn himself. After a two-year wait, they emigrated to the United States. They settled in Lower Manhattan, where Pop worked sewing shirts before finding a job in a print shop. He would remain a printer, ultimately running his own business until he retired in 1990. Soon they had a son, Harris, a daughter, Sylvia, and eventually a second daughter named Helen. Along the way, Ephraim became Frank, Ruzsa became Rose, a records clerk mangled Bushtanovich into Burstinowitz, and when mom and pop were sworn in as U.S. citizens in 1955, the family opted to drop the Owitz and shorten it to Burstin. As the years passed, the inmate who doubted he would survive the camps started to mark his life in milestones, getting married, having children, celebrating simchas and birthdays, their 25th wedding anniversary, their 50th, the arrival of each of their seven grandchildren, and perhaps most of all, seeing the hamotzi at their weddings and bar and bat mitzvot. Each was a moment to savor, each a personal triumph. I believe. I believe in the sun, even when I don't see it shine. I believe in love, even when it is absent. 
I believe in humanity, even though it did nothing to stop the Holocaust. I believe in a future that still is far away. I believe in nature and hope we don't destroy it. I believe in God, even though he was silent. Life was good. He fell in love with the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Mets. He listened to opera and Israeli folk music, enjoyed poetry, and read history voraciously. In retirement, he and Rose traveled widely. He loved the beach. Always the survivor, he recovered from a massive coronary and quadruple bypass surgery by getting hooked on exercise. He even took up golf. But most of all, he loved and doted on his grandchildren. He made it a point to attend every birthday party, every happy occasion, every recital, every graduation. No grandpapa was ever more devoted to his grandkids. He was blessed with many of the traits that helped other survivors cope, including intelligence, tenacity, and optimism. But there is more to this story. While his outward appearance was positive, much more was simmering below the surface. On Yom HaShoah, we typically remember what happened during the Holocaust, but Pop's story also allows us to consider its legacy and lasting impact on the lives of survivors and their families. Yom HaShoah. What good is being chosen when we witness a hopeless task? We even live with suffering in our dreams. Don't you hear our prayers? You once heard our voices. From the depth of our heart, hear us again. Growing up, I always knew that my father had survived the Holocaust. We saw the numbers tattooed on his arm. We knew many of his survivor lancemen. While he sometimes told us about his parents or sisters, however, he never talked about what happened to him. But we knew there were some horrible things in his past. Mom would often have to calm him after horrible nightmares that never faded. Again and again, he later wrote, she lovingly assured him that it was all over. Night. Night, come closer to me. Drift closer around me with your gray shadow. Don't ask me where I came from or where I'm going. I must be off before the shadow flees. I have grown old and maybe wise. I've seen many suns from morning till evening. I always have strange dreams at night, no matter where I sleep. And with the crack of dawn, I'm up. Night. Let my head rest on your lap, and let me have a pleasant dream, and gently rock me to sleep. I had always wanted to know more about our family, so when he retired, I gave him a handheld tape recorder as a gift. I asked him to tell stories about his family and his memories of life in Poland before the war. He started to use the tape recorder, but said it just didn't feel right talking into the box, so he just started to write it out longhand. I said, a good place, nobody bar me, I go down to the pool for the house, sit in the corner, cry my heart out, and I start writing down, and every time I remember something, I just made a note, made a note, and by the time I got through, I finished the whole writing notes, and every time I finished writing notes, I used to send it to Boston. My door is to run it through the computer, send the back for proofreading and correction. At first he said he intended to write only about his family and his happy memories, but then he realized he wanted to tell the whole story. When it was done, he was amazed when he realized he had written an entire book. He did all the typesetting, selected the plate for the gold embossed title Ephraim, and compiled all the photos and graphics, and had copies printed for our family and close friends. During the year we worked together on his book, my father's experiences in the camps became my consciousness. Survived. I cannot find peace. 
My past experiences are still with me. It is almost like a disease with constant pain. But I have learned to live with it, even though I cannot forget. I'm happy because I remember those horror years, how unhappy I was. The good thing about Auschwitz? I have survived and climbed from the bottom up. Can you understand? I don't know. And that is the tragedy. I cannot convey my pain to you. But here I am. I survived. After he wrote the book, Pop said he had purged many of his bad memories and his nightmares went away. He had never wanted to go back before, but now he decided he wanted to return to Poland because as he later wrote, something inside of me was missing. He wanted to go back to say Kaddish for his family, something he was never able to do as the only surviving son. In May of 1997, we toured Warsaw and Ludge, visited Treblinka and Auschwitz, including the barracks for block number four, where he had been an inmate. We made our way to his hometown, Ludomiersk, where we found the house where he was born, the site of the Ludomiersk ghetto, and the pension that his family ran before the war. He was pretty dilapidated, but you could still see signs of the early glory. Pop found the room used as a shul where he'd had his bar mitzvah and stood on the porch where he'd said his prayers. My home. I once had a home, but it is no more. My eyes are full of tears, but I cannot cry. I can still hear children laugh, now dead silent all around. Where did they all go? And they will never return. Once this was a happy place, now it is all sorrow. This place was full of flowers, now Weeds grow over them. While driving around Ludomiersk, he asked our driver to turn down a dirt road where one of his closest childhood friends had lived, a non-Jewish Polish boy named Yosef. We found the house and asked a young man in front of it what had happened to the family that lived there. The young man called his father, who came out of the house. He looked at Pop in disbelief. It was Yosef, Pop's friend. With a video camera, I was able to capture the moment when Yosef first recognized my father and said, Froyim? He, he remembers me like yesterday. Really? <laughs> yes, really. Yeah. You, you survived? Yeah. He said. How you survive? Ashley. He remembered very well. How could, could I forget such a thing? Later, Yosef started to ask my father about what had happened to his sisters, and then looked at me and started to cry because he said I looked so much like Chaya. As they talked, we watched, awestruck by the connection between them. Finally, we visited Chelno, the death camp where all of the 900 Jews from Ludomiersk were killed in gassing vans, including all of our family. At the first stone plaque, as we entered the site of the camp, Pop put on his talit and began to recite the prayer, but broke down and had to start again. For the first and only time, he got to honor his parents and sisters at the only cemetery he'll ever have for them. He later wrote, I felt I had completed the mission in my life. The process of recounting his experiences did not end there. A few months after our return, he taped nearly four hours of oral testimony for the Steven Spielberg-sponsored Shoah Foundation. He then wrote a brief follow-up book on the return trip to Poland. The writing proved to be therapeutic, but September 11, 2001 brought it all back. From his apartment building in Riverdale in the Bronx, 
he could see and sometimes even smell the smoke from the collapsed Twin Towers. September 11, 2001. The half moon hangs in the sky on a partly cloudy night. The air has a scent of burning flesh. All I hear is the lapping of the waves, the rustle of the leaves. I see the flames and the smoke of the ruins. Oh God, if I can ever reach you and rouse you from slumber, I would tell you the truth that is happening to the world that you have created. And maybe you, and only you, can stop this slaughter. In writing his story, Pop had composed a handful of poems. Now with his memoir complete, he wanted to keep writing. So he turned to composing poems about the show up. The poems he would regularly send to Helen and me and the rest of our family were obviously quite dark and a jarring contrast with the smiling, joyous grandpapa we experienced on our family visits. We worried about him. During a visit to New York in 2007, Pop pulled me aside to show off a binder full of poems that he had carefully printed and collated. He was proud of it and eager to, for me to see it. I turned a few pages and then stopped, looked him in the eye, and posed the question I had wanted to ask for years. Pop, these poems are so dark. Are you okay? What I remember most is that there was no hesitation, no awkward silence. He flashed that smile of his and said simply, eventually, I'm going to die and I want your children to know what they did to us. Sorrow. Those sorrowful poems are not my style. This is something that was forced upon me. All this pain rocked my brain. My head is full of sorrow. My soul is full of pain and tears. Those were born in my youth years, all black days, months, and years, stayed with me through those horror years. In June of 2008, Pop wrote his last poem about the Holocaust. It would be another two weeks before his doctors discovered the malignant, inoperable tumors spreading rapidly through his body so we cannot know for certain what was on his mind that day. We do know that he was 83 years old and he knew something was wrong. He would write just one more poem two months later after a brutal morning of radiation therapy, keeping a promise made to his oldest granddaughter, Betsy, to write something to commemorate her upcoming wedding. It was a milestone he would not live to celebrate. But on that day in June, he saved one last Holocaust poem on his computer and, perhaps unknowingly, brought his show up poetry project to a close. Untitled. Looking up to heaven, I ask you, God of our people, why have you hidden your face from us? You must have heard, you must have seen and done nothing till it was too late. We were trashed with whips, gassed and burned just like in hell. Now it is time for you to bring us like birds back to your nest. Did you find that what you went through affected your religious beliefs? Little, little. I could say in Hebrew, <laughs> but uh, I'm, a, I'm not religious, I'm a good Jew. For me, uh, I'll show you something I found in a, in a magazine once. And, uh, and that's what I believe. What it says there mainly is uh, I would rather not pray with Jews who believe in God. I'll rather be with Jews who believe in Hitler and that's me. This book I wrote for my grandchildren and my family that they should remember for years on the whole story of my life 
who my family was, which they never met. And they should always remember what the Holocaust time to us. Thank you, Helen and Mark, for the brilliant presentation on Frank Burston's experience <laughs> during and after the Holocaust. It was a deeply moving program, and we are grateful that you chose to share it with us. Although often painful, it was a beautiful and important remain reminder not to forget, and its images and poetry will be remembered. <clears throat> If you have a question for Helen or Mark, it should be posted in the chat addressed to everyone. Now I'd like to introduce Sid Booth, our moderator for the question and answer period. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat because I think like me, we're all stunned. Um, I uh, would like to start by thanking Helen and Mark for this extraordinary presentation and ask a couple of questions that occurred to me uh, as I listened. Um, resilience in your, your dad uh, was just uh, remarkable. And um, until the end of the presentation, I wondered about the terror and the bitterness that he must have carried in his heart. and somehow not conveyed until it was his intention to do so as a lesson. Um, Helen, as a young person, did, were you aware of the haunting that your father experienced? Yeah, so we all knew, obviously, we saw the numbers on his arm. He had no family, we had no family. So that was very obvious as well. And, you know, for some of you who have grown up in communities like I grew up in Brooklyn, you know, so many of my friends were children of survivors. All of us had parents not born in America. That was sort of our normal experience. But it was clear from his nightmares um, that he had a just much darker, darker side. I, I clearly remember him screaming at night, my mother waking, you know, waking him and calming him back to sleep. Uh, that outwardness, it, he never expressed anger. He never expressed um, anything like that. I mean, if anything, and Mark can certainly attest to this, He's just one of the kindest, most gentle people you'll ever meet. If I remember correctly, he was taken prisoner at age 16. Right, he was young. He ever revealed, and we know that he uh, concluded his life uh, uh, in business as a printer. Did he ever reveal what his ambitions were as a youngster? What he hoped he might do with his life? You know, he... Uh, he he's an he, he was absolutely brilliant and uh, we have this uh, mark knows this you know there's a little bit of the family lore that my father had um pretty much a photographic memory which i somewhat have my son has several members of my extended family have as well you know there was this infamous story when he was a, a foreman at this big printing plant in brooklyn anytime a printing press would break down my father would walk over completely take the machine apart and just put it back together uh you know with just nothing he didn't need notes he had seen it done once before he'd completely memorized it he could just fix it so you know he never got a chance to do anything else he was clearly a scholar uh he very much had an engineer's brain i think he would have loved to have been an engineer um and you know he as mark said he he literally read a book a day he was one of these people who could just never find enough information, uh, was always reading, and uh, it was just extraordinary. Jan Gordon wants to know if the writing uh, contained stories that were mostly new to you, and also how did they change you or your children? Oh, that's such a wonderful question, Jan. Um, they were new to me. Um, 
and it's interesting because, you know, as I asked him to do this when he retired and I gave him this recorder, I thought he would just tell us about our family. I mean, I'm named after Chaya, the woman who his best friend, Yosef, immediately recognized as me because she passed away about my age when we were in Poland together. Um, but I, I knew nothing about her. I knew nothing about my grandparents. We really, so those stories about my family were all new. The level of detail he could share about the camps and the marches completely amazed the folks at the Shoah Foundation. This was the longest interview with a survivor that they did of four hours and two sessions because he had so much, he could literally give them a level of detail because of his memory that was extraordinary. I think it changed me in a couple of ways. First, um, it was amazing to hear the details of what he went through. I think the pain that jumped off the pages of both his books, and I have to say in many ways, his poetry in particular um, was even was even more um, of a wake up call to the darkness that was inside him that we didn't know because it, it, it he was the most bubbly positive person you would ever meet I and mean, he would give anything to anyone and so that was shocking and I think for my children and my daughter read one of his poems at her bat, at her bat mitzvah. Um, I think it was extraordinary to make that connection between this person who was so positive, but then realized this legacy. And actually Dina did this extraordinary program at the Holocaust Museum called Bringing the Lessons Home, where they bring high school kids from across DC, Maryland and Virginia to learn about the Holocaust and become docents. So that connection between what she knew of her grandfather and then seeing it at the museum, I think particularly for her, it was quite impactful. I had one, one little thing. I came to know his story through, largely through the book, um, you know, which he proudly gave me um, not long before we were married and I read. And, and so I thought I had a pretty good idea of the detail uh, all throughout the first early years of our marriage when we were just, uh, you know, uh, very, very busy with two little children and everything else. We had on our shelf the three cassettes from the Shoah Foundation. And I think Helen and I said, you know, we really need to, we, we need to watch this because neither of us had. And it was one of those things that, you know, when is there a good time to sit down and spend three hours reliving the Holocaust about your father? Uh, like the answer is there isn't. Um, and so after he died, when we were starting to produce, when we started thinking about doing this uh, presentation for Yom HaShoah, I copied the, uh, the video onto computer and I put it on my iPad and we took it with us on a long train trip. And I sat for six hours and I was blown away by how much was there that I didn't know. And sadly he was gone at that point. So there were a variety of questions I, you know, would have wished I could ask him that I did that had I played it a few years earlier, I might have, I might have, but. Uh, Helen, you, you spoke about the uh, neighborhood in which you grew up with, where Holocaust fa surviving families were common. Um, did you ever encounter situations that were that showed people had it come through as your father had, or was it, did you see more sadness and 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 uh, illness? Well, he seemed just totally remarkable to me. He was totally remarkable in every way. Um, you know, it, it was really a mixed bag, Sid. I think we saw uh, people who went about their business, but were like actually our very next door neighbors. Uh, he was a survivor as well um, growing up. And his, uh, his daughter was my best friend growing up as well. And he was just quiet, never said a word never smiled, but he wasn't outwardly, you know, in any serious way. Now, interestingly, and then, you know, we haven't really talked very much about my mom who also survived, although survived in, um, uh, you know, had her own travails of her family being in Eastern Poland and going East into Russia and then being forced ultimately from Uzbekistan into Siberia. She and her twin brother were in an orphanage for six years or five years. Um, and, uh, you know, at the age of like six or seven, I mean, just that terrible experience of being starved and separated from your family. So interestingly, she had more sort of psychiatric manifestations than he did. So for very small stresses, my mom would completely dissociate. She would, I remember, I'll distinctly remember this one story when I was little, my mom asked me to go get a 
my father loved rye bread for Shabbat. So I'd go to the walk to the bakery up Avenue L and get him his rye bread. And I was one of those kids, sort of still am, who always had my head in a book. So there I was walking up Avenue L, reading a book, walked into the bakery, took it home, and he didn't like caraway seeds in his rye bread. So I brought it home. My mother took it in the, it was like the classic old uh, uh, bread in a wax paper bag. And she took the bag and she tore it up in her hands. And then she went to her room and she lied in bed, dissociated for two days. Like she was cold and immobile. So she had her own traumas that we didn't even see, right? She didn't have a number on her arm, but she had just incredible traumas as well. So what I'd say is just in short, so many different experiences, so many ways of manifesting it. I think the only way my father could survive was being so positive. Um, and always just seeing the good in the world. And I think really it was only as a result of talking about it, writing about it and sharing his experiences that we began to see the dark side. I, I would just chime in on that. He, he obviously, as many, many Holocaust survivors had uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, in his case, it tended to manifest at night and in private and you didn't see it. Um, for many survivors, it manifested in ways you could see it and you could see the, what they dealt with. Um, I read about it a little bit, um, you know, after getting to know him, um, I read a couple books by uh, Israeli psychologists who looked at uh, post-traumatic stress with Holocaust survivors. And one of the things that they find or they found is that the, the qualities that he had, the optimism, the, the, the placid, the hap, you know, the, the, the ease with other people, that was very, that was a very common strain with a lot of survivors. And I think it's fair to think that obviously luck played a huge role in, in who survived and who didn't. Um, but that ability to see the positive was a tool in, in his survival. And I think for many others as well. The scene where uh, your father uh, puts on his talit and he uh, says Kaddish for the family in, uh, was it Auschwitz? Uh, hell no. Hell no, yeah. Um, makes me wonder what kind of a Jewish upbringing did you have given your father's attitude toward God, which may be different than his attitude toward Judaism. <laughs> yeah, that whole Bilachon thing is something Mark and Rabbi Zemel have had a lot of conversations about over the years. Um, it was a traditional Jewish household. I mean, we, we grew up speaking Yiddish at home. Uh, that's what my parents spoke. I think I'm 10 years younger than my brother and seven years younger than my sister. So I had a lot more English spoken because they spoke English. But my parents would speak English and we would tend to respond in Yiddish. So is very the, culturally- Right there. Where did he acquire his English and this extraordinary fluency? You know, again, I think some of it was, he was just one of the smartest people I knew. He taught himself how to read and write when he came. Okay. He read the newspaper every day. He read more books than you could ever imagine. Um, so I think that's kind of how he did it. But you know, we, we, we went to temple. Interestingly, uh, some of the folks may, may know that Eastern European Jews don't tend to send their, Jew, their, their girls to Hebrew school. It's what you do only for boys. So Mark will remember how old I was, but I, I did my uh, adult B'nai Mitzvah at, uh, at Temple Micah, uh, I think when I was about 50, which was uh, amazing and really, really hard. <laughs> But, you know, that was something girls don't do, but it was something I had a remarkable experience with. So I felt very Jewish growing up, um, very spiritually Jewish. Um, he just, you know, and my mom was obsessed with like doing the right things and would cut little squares for Yom Kippur for toilet paper. But, you know, there was not as much. Um, we did, for the most part, keep kosher, except I distinctly remember during the recession when he lost his union job. And I remember my mom, who worked as a cafeteria worker in the public school, used to bring home all the surplus food. So some things that were salami were clearly not salami, but, uh, you know, I think it was out of necessity. Elsie uh, comments, uh with thanks for sharing this important story and asks, uh, could you comment on how having parents who had lived with memories of the Shoah has formed you and has it motivated you to live your life in a certain way? Oh, absolutely, without question. I, I, I think there are a couple ways it's manifested. I think one is I think even from a very early age, the sense that you're you're growing up with parents who you sort of view as wounded birds in a way. And you know, Mark and I kind of bonded about this a lot early on because his parents are both polio survivors. So the sense of growing up with parents who you knew had you know pain and issues, 
that they were dealing with every day, I think probably made me less likely to be, an, you know, acting out as a teenager. And, you know, I was always the kid who was straight A, never got in trouble, et cetera. Um, but I think there was a price to pay. I think always the sense of trying to be perfect. It was not easy um, and uh, definitely stressful and led to some, interestingly, the first time I went into therapy, as you might imagine, was actually when I came back from the trip from Poland with my father. That was so intense for me in a way that I could no longer sleep. I was a physician, at, you know, full-time physician at the Brigham. I was acting as teaching medical students and I could no longer sleep. Uh, so that was the first time I went to uh, therapy and had just an extraordinary therapist who helped me through that. But the other thing that happens to children of survivors, and if you've read any of the work by Helen Epstein is one of the major writers in this space, we tend to be people who want to sort of save the world. So it's probably not an accident. My brother and I are both physicians. Um, I think, you know, very much live that world of, you know, always wanting to give back. And your kids? How has this been kept passed on? I'm going to help out while Helen recom re recomposes my role in these things generally. <laughs> um, our daughter is, is Helen. Um, is, uh, in, 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 she looks a little bit like me, but she uh, looks mostly like Helen and, and, and follows it. And I, I think my son has that same uh, love of history and, and, and reminds everyone uh, who knows him of, of, his, of his grandfather. Ellen, anything? We'll see. For now, Dina says she wants to be a doctor, so maybe it goes on. Well, I uh, we don't have many questions in the uh, chat. I think people are saving it for the breakout rooms, to which we will uh, move very shortly. So I think this is the time to ask Karen to step up. Sid, Sid Nancy has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sure. Nancy, Nancy Raskin posed a one more question. Nancy, yeah, so I, I can see the chat, uh, Sid, so I can answer. So yes, they did visit Israel. My father really wanted to move to Israel after the war, to be honest. That was his dream. He didn't get to go because they discovered some of my mom's family had survived and were going to the United States. So that's why they shifted. He shifted to going there. He loved Israel. I mean, this was really in his heart. He was, I think, more than anything else, a Zionist. And I think some of it probably related to that deep, dark uh, feeling we heard from him in later life, which is he was pretty convinced that Israel would be the place we would have to go because if this was going to happen again, we had to have a place to go. Uh, so he was very passionate about having that, you know, being in the Irgun. Uh, when Mark and I went with uh, the kids on uh, one of Rabbi Zemel's Israel trips, I think Ariel with, was with us actually, uh, you know, going to the Irgun Museum was just, you could just, my father so clearly would have loved that, was very proud of the fact that their North, the Northern Italian uh, command of the Irgun supposedly shipped some of the bombs that blew up the King David Hotel. Um, and so this was a really big part of his existence. Um, and I think for him, Israel was the place we could have gone to survive. And it was the place that had to exist so we'd have some place to go in case this horrible tragedy hit again. And uh, certainly this recent history, boy, it, you know, he, the anti-Semitism we've seen over the years, I've often said to Mark, you know, if he wasn't gone, would kill him. He just couldn't handle sort of what happened in Charlottesville or some of the recent evidence of swastikas on, temp on uh, temples and elsewhere. All right, Karen, I think it's up to you. Okay, thank you, thank you Sid, for doing your usual ma magic as our moderator. Um, I also wanna thank David, Francie, Sid, Jerry, Barbara, and the whole Lunch and Learn Committee for their faithful work, which keeps this enterprise flourishing. Thanks for, to the Temple Mica office staff, particularly Jean Dissa, Janelle Dissa, who produces our monthly flyers and cheerfully handles everything else we throw at her for her work on this presentation and for being my excellent partner as we assume the role of new co-chairs. Many, many thanks to Harriet Wiener. And for unending support and getting us up and running, we thank Nancy and Phyllis, who are a very hard act to follow. Next month, we are lucky to be able to present another talented MICA member, Dan Moskowitz, whose knowledge of musical theater and popular American music have delighted attendees at OLLI the Osher Institute for Living and Learning at American University for years, and who will enlighten us and entertain us with his presentation, How Oklahoma 
change the standards for the Broadway musical. Please register by Monday, October 9th. We cannot ensure that you'll receive a Zoom link if you register later. Now, before we go to the breakout rooms, we would like to acknowledge that today is Betty Uston's 90th birthday. Since we cannot all together sing, uh, sing together over Zoom, Laura Ferguson is going to play happy birthday on her clarinet and everyone can sing along privately. Laura. I didn't give her enough warning probably to get her clarinet out. <laughs> I think she's on mute though. Oh, maybe she's on mute. And many, many more. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Laura. And that was lovely, and we want to wish best wishes to, be to Betty. Helen and Mark have left us with one question, which will help us to start the discussion in the breakout rooms, to which we will go in a few moments. What do you think Frank meant by his remark near the end? You know what they say in Israel, bitachon. For those of you who don't know, bitachon is a Hebrew word usually defined as trust in God or faith. Secular Zionism has shifted the meaning in Israel to trusting more in ourselves, and Bitachon is now the name of the security checks, such as before boarding El Al flights and other common uses of, of the word as security. Now we are ready to have our resident technical genius, David, discuss.